Okay, I want to read to you from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14. It's a well-known passage, but I want to bring three truths out of this today. Matthew 14, 22, it says this. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night he was there alone and the, the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. And when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. I want to speak to you today on the power of your imagination. The power of your imagination. I wonder if you've ever thought for a moment about how powerful your imagination is. Let me just give you a couple of quotes from some well-known people that kind of help us to kind of get into this. Albert Einstein said this, Imagination is more important than knowledge. Napoleon Bonaparte said, imagination rules the world. And Lewis Carroll, writing in the book Alice in Wonderland, said this, imagination is the only weapon in the war against reality. And then Mark Twain said this, reality can be beaten with enough imagination. Now there's three things from this passage I want to bring out to you today. And the first thing is this, to say that your imagination can make your reality redundant. I want us to enter the passage. When you read the Bible, don't just read the Bible, enter the Bible. Don't just read a verse, enter the verse. And I want you to get into this scene, and I want you to step into the boat on this night, and it's about three o'clock in the morning. And John's Gospel tells us they were about three to four miles from shore. And they'd been rowing for hours. It was a severe storm, and they were getting nowhere. And in the darkness... Jesus approaches the boat walking on the water. So when they are making no progress, Jesus is still making progress. He's walking towards them. And I want to say to you this morning, very simply before I move on, church, whatever is against you, no matter how strong the wind is against you, nothing can slow him down. He still walks according to his purpose, no matter how great the storm is that's against us. And often what is a storm to you is a pathway for him. And the disciples see this figure coming on the water, and it says they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. From that we have to learn this. There will be times in your life and times in your church life when your view of the Lord is blurred. Times when you want to see him clearly, but the circumstances do not allow you to see him clearly. There's times when it's dark, and there's times when the waves are higher than your head, and so your view of the Lord is not clear. But when you can't see the word, you must cling to what you hear from the word. So Jesus speaks, it is I. And there's times when you can't see Jesus very well, but at those times, listen to the word and hold on to that word. Now, verse 28 introduces us to one of the craziest verses in the Bible. Peter says, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Note what he didn't say. He didn't say, Lord, if it's you, let me help you in the boat. He didn't say, Lord, if it's you, why did you send us into this mess? He didn't say, Lord, if it's you, please get us out of here. He didn't even say, Lord, if it's you, please make this storm stop. This is what he said, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. That's the power of imagination. On the water. If you read the Old Testament, you will find that there are two records of God's people walking through water. They walked through the Red Sea. They walked through the Jordan 
but nobody had ever walked on the water. So where does that come from? It came from his imagination. Peter asked for something that had never been done before. And listen to me. This is what happens. Imagination sets you apart from those who are stuck in their reality. No one else in that boat imagined that. No one else in that boat asked for that. Because everybody else in that boat was stuck in their reality, which was darkness and a storm. But Peter, his lone voice, while others were looking for protection, Peter was imagining possibilities. And Peter, through his imagination, made his reality redundant. Listen to me. It's imagination that changes the world. Have you ever thought about how many things we now enjoy today that began as somebody else's imagination? Microwaves, flat screen TVs, mobile phones. I mean, EasyJet said that in 10 years' time they will have an electric plane. I don't know about when the battery goes for that, I don't know. But just imagine that because what happens is before you ever see something, people imagined it. And it's the imagination that produced it. What other people just settled for what was, other people dreamed of other possibilities. It sounded crazy, but people couldn't help it. Do you know what imagination is? Imagination is the deepest voice of the soul. Imagination is the eye of the soul. Albert Einstein said, your imagination is your preview of life's coming attractions. So... What are you imagining? What are you dreaming? For Peter, his reality had been in a dark, dark, stormy place, lost its power over him, and imagination took the driving seat of his life. It's imagination that distinguishes churches from churches, leaders from leaders, and people from people. The other disciples were still rowing in that boat, and they must have thought Peter was crazy because they were still just rowing while Peter was imagining. They were getting nowhere while Peter, in his imagination, was going somewhere else. And the response of Jesus was one word. Come. This is what I believe today. God will not give you permission for something you can't imagine. Do you remember the woman with the issue of blood in Mark chapter 5? This is what it says about her. She thought in her mind. She thought in her mind, if I can just touch him. So in other words, she touched him before she touched him. She imagined touching him before she touched him. If she hadn't imagined touching him, she would not have touched him. If Peter had not imagined walking on water, he would not have walked on water. And the Bible says this, in Psalm 37 verse 4, Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires or the imaginations of your heart. And Mark's Gospel says a very important thing. It says Jesus was about to pass them by, but he didn't. Why didn't Jesus pass them by? Because somebody with imagination called out to him. If Peter had not called, the Bible says Jesus would have passed them by. Let me ask you a question. How many times does Jesus pass by churches because they don't have imagination? How many times does Jesus pass by Christian believers because they're too obsessed with their current reality to imagine that something greater could be? How often does Jesus pass by because he's looking for dreamers and nobody's dreaming? I believe we must imagine the miracle before we see the miracle. And a, star, a, a dark, stormy world in which we live today, it demands Christians. It demands churches with imaginations that attract the empowering power of heaven yeah. upon those dreams. Mark Batterson said a very strong, powerful thing. He said this, At some point in our lives, most of us stop living out of imagination and start living out of memory. What a powerful thing that is. Cursing the darkness doesn't bring light. 
And sure, we look around our nation today and we think, yes, things are bad in our land. Yes, there's lots of need in our land. But can we, can we, even in the Warrington area, can we believe that there can be a glorious, growing, light-shining church that is the center of hope in every community that where you put your feet? That's the first thing. Your imagination can make your reality redundant. But then secondly, your imagination can also clothe you in defeat and failure. Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Notice, he did everything he imagined. Exactly. But then suddenly, we see a different imagination. It says in verse 30, But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. Now notice, when he got out of the boat, he didn't see the wind. But you see, the wind was not new. It was there in verse 24. It says the, the, the boat was buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. So why now when Peter's walking on the water, does the wind suddenly become a problem? It had been there before, so why now? And the answer is very clear, because he saw it. He saw it. He saw and focused on what was against him. And immediately, a new imagination filled his mind that brought him back to his reality. We are not called to fix our eyes on what's against us. We're called to fix our eyes on what is for us. And I want you to see something really important here. The waves didn't sink him. The wind didn't sink him. Peter sank himself. He sank because he now had a different imagination it was the darkest part of the night and the easiest time to see the wind is when you can't see the word it doesn't even say that peter took his eyes off jesus it simply says that peter put his eyes on the wind and that's what your enemy and my enemy will always seek to get us to do to get our eyes on what's against us and not on who is for us and do you know what happened? When Peter looked at what was against him, this is what happened. He actually empowered his negative imagination. So from imagining walking on water, his imagination changed to sinking in water, and he did both. He did both those things. And we have a choice. We can build our, our imagination on the word that is for us, or we can build it on the wind that is against us. And the wind speaks of anything that's against you. And I want to inspire you and encourage you today, church, to have your dreams and your imaginations. Have them, have them, have them. But remember, they will come against you, those things that will distract you. Negative voices will come against you. Doubts will come against you. Opposition will come against you. Challenge, sicknesses, hostilities. And this is a trouble. Our imagination can empower what's weaker than us to have power over us. The wind was not the power, most powerful thing in that area at that time. Jesus was the most powerful thing in that area. But you see, Peter's imagination empowered the wind which he had power over of through Jesus. He now empowered the negative to actually take control of his situation. That is why Peter... The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 10.5 says this. We are to cast down imaginations. Or as the one version puts it, we are to demolish arguments and pretensions. In your life and in my life, there are some imaginations that need eradicating and there are some imaginations that need empowering. You will have imaginations that need eradicating and if you don't cast them down, they will cast you down. They really, really will. And let me tell you something. A lot of Christians believe in casting out demons. But often we forget how important it is for us to cast down imaginations. Because if we don't cast down negative imaginations, they will cast us down without no shadow of a doubt. Every day, 
you will have those negative imaginations. Let me just give you some examples about how those negative imaginations can affect us. Have you ever been in a prayer meeting and you, you, you pray for th- great things and you start to believe God and you say, Lord God, help us to do this, help us to do this. And you go out all fired up from the prayer meeting, but then on the way home you start to think, yeah, but what if? What if? Suddenly an imagination comes. And if you don't cast that down, it's amazing how many projects can be cancelled. Simply because you dreamed, perhaps we could do this. And Jesus says, come. And then we start, but then we think, yeah, but what about that? What about that? What about that? What about that? Sometimes we think, well, you know, we see somebody on the street that's begging you. And we think, I could give them some money right now. And that would be a good prompt from the scripture to give to the poor. But then you think, yeah, but what if they spend it on this? And a negative imagination makes you walk by and you keep your hand in your pocket. But what if they didn't spend it on that? But you see, suddenly, from a, from a positive imagination to being a blessing, you now be, have a negative imagination that stops you. It changes everything. How many times do you go for a job interview and you'll say, I'll never get that job? So suddenly a negative imagination that should have cast down, cast you down. So often you know in church life, and this is where you need to pray for your leaders, because so often the leaders will meet together and they'll think, well, you know, I think God's saying us we should do that. And then you think, yeah, but will the people like that? And, and if we do that, there's some people who are not going to like it. So in the end, we get a divine dream, and then we have an, an, a human negative ima- imagination that stops us from progressing. Have you ever felt when there's been a need for money? Oh, I could, I could, I've got that money. I could actually do that. I, th- I could give that. And then you think, yeah, but if I give it, what if my car breaks down? Or what if I need it for something like that? And so from a positive imagination, you have a negative imagination. Have you ever had a time when you felt sick, felt ill? And then all of a sudden you start to Google it. And the next thing, you're planning your funeral and ordering the wreath. (laughs) Where does that come from? Negative imagination that paralyzes and sterilizes. Or if you've ever ever been, any of you young people here, and you're in a relationship and somebody dumps you, and you say, I can't live without them. Yes, you can. (laughs) My Bible says you can. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. We talk such nonsense. How many times do you you see two two people talking in the church and you think they're talking about me? Why do you think that? Negative imagination. It's ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. So many projects in church life, so many ministries fail because we allow a negative imagination to paint a picture of failure. Jesus didn't say come in order for you to fail. If he gives you a rhema word, it's for your blessing and success. In our church in Mid Wales, four years ago, we it's only a 300 seater, so we demolished it. We'd extended it twice, we could extend it no more, so we, we demolished it and launched out on a 3.2 million. We were a church of 300 in Mid Wales, launched on a 3.2 million project. And then the builder went bust. And what was a 3.2 million project became a 5.2 million project. And we went through a tough time over the last four years. But nine weeks ago, we moved into the middle floor of this three-story building. It's our modern contemporary cathedral in Newtown, a town of 11,000 people. And in those last four years, God has provided us with 4.3 million pounds. We only need 900,000 to get the top floor and the bottom floor finished. But we now have a 600-seat auditorium and a 120-seat coffee bar, and it's just beautiful. Where did it all start? Imagination. And even when the builder went bust, we still saw it finished in our minds because this was that dream that God said, go for it, go for it, go for it. We are the only provider of nursing care in our town. We are the only provider of care for people with dementia and Alzheimer's. Because 17 years ago, we had a dream. What if we as a church could actually provide a nursing home for this town? 
because there was no nursing home. People had to go to Chester or Shrewsbury, nursing care. What if we as a church could do that? And so, by God's grace, we raised two and a half million pounds for a 40 bedded nursing home. It's been open and packed full for the last 17 years. Many have had their last days in that home. We employ 80 people in that home. Where did all that start? We're still the only provider in our town of nursing care and for people with Alzheimer's and de dementia. Where does all that come from? It comes from sitting and looking at a dark storm and thinking there's a need here. Nobody's doing anything about it. What if, what if we could do something about this? And he says, come. He says, come. The builder went bust on that job too. But we finished it for the glory of God. Before I move on to the third thing, which I really want to push today, never forget that Jesus walks on top of that which threatens you. And Jesus walks on top of every storm that comes against you. The third thing I want you to see is this. Your imagination can frame your greatest prayers. Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. Paul, Peter imagined walking on water and God made it possible. Now listen to me. God will not say yes to every imagination you have. God will not say yes to every prayer that you pray. And there's a good reason for that, because God has wisdom much higher than ours. But this is the point of this text. This is what God is teaching us there, that no prayer we ever pray can be too big for God. That's the point. You know, five years ago, Newtown was a ghost town. Our town was a ghost town, five years ago. The shops were empty everywhere. There was massive financial need in the town. Factories were closing and moving out. So what did we do as a church? As a church, we called the town to pray. We wrote to the, all the politicians and we hired the high school. And we just said, we need to pray for our town. And so the police came, social services came, school heads came, politicians came. They didn't really know what they were coming to. But we, we laid hands on every single one of them. We laid hands on the MP, we laid hands on the AM in the Welsh Assembly Government, we laid hands on the social workers, we laid hands on, on business leaders. About 400 Christians gathered to pray for the town five years ago. Do you know what, since that moment, since that moment, the police say crime figures have gone down. In that, since that moment, shops have been filled, businesses have come into the town. It's changed the whole area of our town because of prayer. In fact, the mayor of our town is in our church today. The deputy mayor of our town is a church member in our place, both mayor and deputy mayor. We have an assembly member in the Welsh Assembly. We have five people on local and the Powers County Council. Things have changed. Christians have become governors in schools. You see, we prayed. Can God do something about a town that's been mocked on YouTube as being called a, go a ghost town? Is God able to do is he able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all? Yes, he is. Our imagination can frame our greatest prayers. Can I just encourage you with this? When I, we were growing up, I'm, I'm the oldest of three brothers. and grew up in a, in a Christian church like this, in Kersley. And when we were, we, were, we were dragged to church from being babies, and when we were kind of growing up as three boys, two ginger-headed and one brown ones, I don't know where his hair come from, but we had two gingers. Uh, actually, I'd, I'd be very grateful of some ginger hair now if I could actually get some. But, but when our parents used to take us out to church houses for meals, we got grilled before we went in. Because we were kind of, we, had, we were always scrapping as, as brothers we were. We always saw this. Now listen, when you're offered a biscuit, take one. Just one. So we would sit there and look at these chocolate biscuits or whatever and uh, if we'd have had our own way we'd have snatched the lot but we just had to take one biscuit and be very good so that when we got out we wouldn't get a right telling off do you know what sometimes I think as Christians we act like one biscuit Christians 
So we come to the banqueting table as if God says, take one only. <laughs> Don't take too many. Well, I tell you today, when it comes now to the banqueting table of our God, I'm a grabber. <laughs> I believe God wants five biscuit kids and ten biscuit kids and twenty biscuit kids because he says this, Whatever you pray for, whatever you imagine, he is able to do even greater than you can think or even imagine. Good manners aren't necessary at God's table. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Come with great confidence to ask. Do you know what our problem is as Christians? We don't ask for enough. We ask for small things. So often we boldly pray for little things. So often we, we look at the storm and not the throne. And we allow our reality to determine our faith level. And I want to challenge you. When was the last time you prayed from your imagination? When was the last time you prayed from your imagination, not your circumstances? For example, you may have witnessed to your family. And, and, and they, they just haven't come along to the meetings. Or you may have invited them to come at Christmas and they haven't yet come. And so you just simply think, well, they're never going to come. Who says? That's a negative imagination. What if this year they will come? You see, this is the whole thing. Why, not? Why can't everyone in your family get saved? Is that too hard for God to do? Can't you imagine your whole family being on your row in church? Or is that too difficult for God? You see, friends, if that is true, that our God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or even imagine, if that is true, we should be praying bold prayers, big prayers. That huge failure, why can't it be turned into something successful? Why can't we ask God for money? It's only money. It's only money. You know what? This is the amazing thing, you see. The Bible says we have not because we ask not. We have prayed every week in a prayer meeting for the last few years for money. I mean, we had, we had one grant of £160,000 that came from Hong Kong to the middle of Wales. Where does that come from? From, from heaven. From heaven. In, in, in June this year, on one occasion, our bank phoned us up. And said somebody has just put £100,000 anonymously into your bank account. Well, how did that come from? Three weeks later, £75,000 anonymously into the bank account. Where did that come from? Let me tell you something. If we had no imaginations, that money would never have come. But when we start to ask, I believe God gets excited when we start to believe his word. Why can't we ask God to bless every person in business in the local church and prosper them? Why can't we ask for everyone in the church to get increases in their jobs? Why can't we ask? Does the Bible say, listen, don't ask too much? I think sometimes, you know, we insult God with small dreams. We insult God with low ambitions, low expectations, when he's waiting to do exceedingly abundantly. I actually believe that on heaven's throne room doors, I come to close. There's a big sign that says, imaginations welcome here. Now, of course, we know that Peter began to sink. And it says, he said, Lord, save me. And it says, immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Do you know what? Jesus could have let him sink. And that chapter could have ended there, and Peter drowned. <laughs> chapter 15, verse 1, and the church mourned and buried Peter. <laughs> that could have been there, couldn't it? It really could. And every preacher for the last 2,000 years would have said, now listen, remember what happened to Peter, don't dream too big. <laughs> that's, what, that's what could have happened. But it didn't say that. It says immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. And this is important. Sinking, you see, failure was not the last thing that happened here. So many, so many people have this picture that somehow this all happened at the side of the boat, but it actually says that very early on that this Peter walked 
away from the boat toward Jesus. So they were away from the boat. And as soon as he began to sink, Jesus rescued him. What do you think happened then? Well, the Bible tells us they actually had a conversation on the water. Not in the boat, on the water. Now imagine that. So when they were having this conversation on the water, what was Peter doing? Was he kind of like his head just down there and Jesus reaching out, just keeping his head above the water? Or did actually Jesus lift, lift him up? That means this, and it says this also. They both climbed into the boat. So Jesus didn't give him a piggyback back to the boat. He didn't kind of drag him through the water helping him to swim. He lifted him up so Peter walked again back to the boat. And I want to encourage you, there'll be times when you get wet if you have imaginations for God. But you won't drown. Because God is a great catcher. He's a great catcher. And if you are wet here today and you feel, I tried something and it failed, okay, dream again. Dream again. Yeah, you might think, well, we tried that, but it didn't work then. Okay, there's a new day coming. God is a great catcher. So as I close, God's word is always success in our lives. And I want to encourage you, dream and dream big. Look at this area of yours and think, what could God do here? What could God? What could God? Perhaps God could do this. Perhaps God could do that. Well, two things. If you are one of those people who need to cast down some imaginations that are negative today, cast them down and be free from them. Or if you are someone here today and you've got wet, right, there's somebody here to reach out his hand and catch you and lift you up and restore you so that you'll walk again. May God bless you in Jesus' name.